so welcome everybody to my talk. Uh, I'm excited that you uh, came, came to it. Uh, not scared of the parentheses. Uh, well, um, that's a joke aside. Um, the talk will be about half a minute, uh, half an hour long, uh, and I'll show in the beginning uh, there will be a bit of theory, uh, some explanations, and later on, about uh, from the starting and the half, there will be uh, practical examples. Okay. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, if they are short, you can ask them in between. If if they are longer, perhaps um, wait for the Q and A. I, I plan to have five to ten minutes Q and A, so we should be on the longer side. Uh, my name is Adam, uh, and I will be. Uh, uh, presenting here uh, about uh, superpowers for closure and closure script. Um, who am I? Uh, I am a co founder of OrcPad, as you can see. You can write me an email, uh, and I'm responsible for infrastructure and security there. So perhaps some of the stuff uh, that you will see, um, you will think, oh my god, he is connecting to you know, some production environment or whatever, and, but that's fine. Uh, uh, I, I know what I am doing. So, about Lisp. Why, why am I talking at, uh, about Lisp at all? Well, Clojure and Clojure Script are dialects of Lisp. And there are many people talking about Lisp and uh, Hacker News main page is, there is a, 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 every second day is something about Lisp or Clojure. Uh, just uh, today I have looked uh, there was a discussion why was Reddit uh, 1.0 written in Lisp and then they switched to Python and what's the, what is it all about. So uh, I have put down so, some quotes about Lisp. Um, you can see the XKCD in the middle. Uh, these are your fa uh, father's parentheses, elegant weapons for a more civilized age. Uh, stuff like that. People, uh, many people are saying very positive things about Lisp. And of course, there are some people that uh, tell very negative things about Lisp. And so what is the buzz all about, right? You can see the quote by Eric S. Raymond. Lisp is worth learning for a different reason, the profound enlightenment experience you will have when you finally get it. The experience will make you a better programmer for the rest of your days even if you never actually use Lisp itself a lot. Right. So about that enlightenment experience, um, I hope I, I will convey some of it to you. So what is closure about? Why, why should we have another language? Why should we you know, develop stuff at all? Why should we think about these problems? Why should we consider different approaches uh, to programming. Well, we have many problems writing, running, and evolving informational systems. Among other things is that we tend to solve puzzles. You know, we, we, have, we have difficult constructs that we occupy our mind with, and uh, then we don't, get, uh, that we don't solve the problems. We solve puzzles, but we don't actually solve like, real problems that customers are willing to pay for. Um, as the systems grow bigger, we tend to encounter a Tower of Babel that we have so many different approaches, so many different modules, and everything is kind of uh, interconnected and not in the right way. It's, it's getting difficult. It's tangled spaghetti, right? Um, also, when we write some languages, we tend to discover some hidden semantics. We um, discover that perhaps uh, concatenating two arrays is not an array, or uh, concatenating uh, an array and an object produces uh, different things uh, depending on the order of uh, operations and so on. So uh, these are all like small puzzles again, uh, right? uh, hidden semantics, hidden uh, syntax that, that we don't intuitively know what to do with. Right? And uh, the problem is that we don't have any predictability. So we cannot 
we cannot go to the boss, we cannot go to the customer and say, okay, we will finish our job in like half a week and then we will do some integration tests and so on and it will be all hunky-dory. Uh, we just, we, we don't know, that is, uh, we, we are not sure, we, we cannot promise. And that is, that is really bad and that's keeping the whole industry uh, back. So, are we perhaps uh, not using the right approaches? Do we have the right foundations? Well, that's a good question. Well, there are some approaches, well known, um, usually more in the functional programming space, uh, that we try to focus more on the, on the what, not the how. Right? We don't tell the computer exactly each step, like we are not micromanaging the computer, we are more telling, okay, this is like the overall idea I want to have, right? And that is um, obviously taken to the extreme with the, all, uh, the, with the AI uh, bubble right now, right? We, we, don't, we don't even know what, is the, uh, what, what the computer is doing precisely. Right? Um, perhaps we are too much focused on rigid and mutable uh, data structures that um, are perhaps good for performance because the processor can work more efficiently using this, but uh, we as humans are not very good at understanding these like, small, small uh, places connected to, uh, somehow to, uh, to another. We, don't, we, we are not good at shuffling bytes and bits as humans. And uh, obviously, we uh, all the time we have problems with uh, state management, right? Concurrent programming uh, is very difficult, and somehow we don't we don't have any good tools uh, to cope, right? So, what what can we do? I, I would like to focus on what what is actually data and what is what is code. So, well, data is information. We don't. It's information in itself. Uh, it has to be processed to uh, convey some some meaning, right? And it's especially data doesn't uh, or is not uh, instructions how to do something. It's not. Uh, it, it we can we can record some instructions, but uh, to, for them to be instructions, we have to do something extra, right? For instance, run. Uh, th this as code. Right. So, what is um, what is code? Yeah, well, that is uh, the, the set of instructions I was talking about. Um, so that is the point five in the Merriam-Webster dictionary: instructions for a computer or within a piece of software. So, uh, yes, that's about the definitions. Uh, you are probably non not very, uh, not much smarter uh, right now. So I try to approximate um, uh, or show some examples what, what I mean. Well, we have many complex systems and we have, they, they run and we don't usually change much in, in those systems, we configure those systems. So to some degree, it is foreseen by the designers of the system that this will be possible. Uh, somehow. If you configure the system correctly, you will <coughs> achieve some goal. And so you have uh, some Red Hat technologies, for instance, like Ansible. And uh, of course, you have, you have some configuration files like this, right? So, um, so that, that is quite understandable. But what about um, web browsers? Do they have any configuration? Right? What do you think? Well, HTML is kind of a configuration for a browser. The browser has to render uh, this uh, based, on, based on the input, but it's, it's a configuration, so to say. Um, yeah. We have uh, Maven. Uh, if you are in the Java world, then you probably know. Uh, it's a build tool and also it has a configuration, of course. So, what, so is this data or is that code. Well, it's an instruction how to put pieces of software together, right? But it's represented as data. It's, it's not Java code, it's XML. 
So there is some, some duality to data and to code. So what can we do about it? Well, uh, we, could, we could, for instance, think about it in the context of compilers, another big system that we configure by putting in a stream of characters out, out of which a program gets compiled, usually, right? And that is all very, very complex. Well, we can, we can perhaps think about some, some other ideas uh, to represent code and data with the same means. Uh, this is a joke about Lisp and uh, parentheses heavy uh, syntax. So I want to introduce you to closure finally. Uh, what is closure? So Rich Hickey, uh, the author of closure, wrote on, on the website. Closure is a dynamic general purpose programming language combining the approachability and interactive development of a scripting language with an e efficient and robust infrastructure for multi-threaded programming. Closure is a complicated language yet remains completely dynamic. Every feature supported by Closure is supported at runtime. Closure provides easy access to the Java frameworks with optional type hints and type inference to ensure that calls to Java can avoid reflection. Closure is a dialect of Lisp and shares with Lisp the code as data philosophy and a powerful macro system. Closure is predominantly a functional programming language and features a rich set of immutable persistent data structures. When mutable state is needed, Clojure offers a software transactional memory system and reactive agent system that ensures clean, correct, and multi-threaded designs. So what's this all about? That's very condensed, right? So dynamic, what does it mean? Well, there are no, uh, no, no explicit static types. You don't, you don't work for the compiler, the compiler work, works for you, right? Uh, general purpose programming language. Uh, it's suited for application programming, for uh, all kinds of re uh, real-time systems, uh, web development, right? Perhaps uh, it's not as suited for driver development, but if, if you can imagine writing drivers in Java, you should, uh, sh uh, surely could write them in Clojure as well. Uh, so that's uh, about it. Uh, the, Interactive development of a scripting language. Well, it's dynamic, so it's m much less code. It's more. M it's not as verbose, and therefore it's much easier to type interactively and do something. Uh, efficient and robust. Each time you write something in the REPL or evaluate a program, then it gets trans uh, that gets compiled down to JIT JVM code. So. Uh, the efficiency should be uh, similar to Java, right? Depending on how you write. Um, and uh, everything is supported at runtime. So everything, if, if it wasn't, it would be very hard for, for the inter interactive development because you wouldn't know what, what you can evaluate uh, at runtime and not, it would be very difficult. In, it would be uh, not non-predictable, right? And uh, what, what, what it means to be a dialect of Lisp, I'll try to answer in the next slides. So uh, the language has some common literals. Um, I think you recognize most of them. Uh, however, I want to point out um, the last four lines, uh, the nil, um, ratio, symbol, and keyword. Well, nil is similar to null. However, in the closure script uh, dialect, you know there in JavaScript you have null and unknown, right? And uh, so closure script doesn't have it, doesn't have it, and uh, both is nil. Uh, ratio is uh, very useful if you want to represent uh, fractions uh, exactly, 
so that you can basically defer uh, losing um, precision at a, to, to a later point. A symbol is, is uh, useful, you can think of it to some degree as a variable. It's something that, that can hold uh, a function, that can hold data, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a name for something basically. And the keyword um, is, is something like a label. So it, it represents itself, has some, function, uh, has some properties of a function in certain places. And especially a useful thing is that it can be namespaced as, uh, as pretty much anything in Clojure. So you can, uh, if you represent uh, users, then you have a data, some data structure. For instance, if you retrieve a list of users from a database, then you can say, okay, uh, I get I get all those users as a uh, uh, sequence of maps, and each of the maps has uh, keys that are named username, user last name, user date of birth, and so on. Right. So uh, I have spoken about sequences uh, and collections. So there are four: uh, the typical list, uh, vector, map, and set. They each have some interesting properties, uh, very useful for programming, and I will show them in a moment. So, um, yes. So how, how does a function call look like? Well, you see it's basically a list that has uh, two elements. The first element um, gets evaluated. It's the print function, print line function and the second element and any other element would be arguments to this uh, function. But you could view it as a list. Right? So how do you define a function? Well, again, it's a list, has uh, five elements. Uh, first is the f definition, then the symbol that holds the function, uh, then a string that is basically a comment uh, or not, um, uh, documentation uh, string basically and then a vector of arguments here you can see that is one argument and then there is a, f a function that that gets called uh, it's, a, it's a string function so it basically concatenates hello and then your name that, so, right. and you could view it that is the same as I, as I said so, what is great about Clojure? Consistent and predictable sy syntax and semantics because everything is a data structure. So that is very simple. It's easy for, uh, for the compiler to evaluate it. The whole uh, parsing is basically 800 lines of Java code and uh, that's it. So that is, that is the first stage of your compiler more or less. Um, you have uh, persistent data structures. What's that all about? I will show in, in the example. So, because we are a bit short on time, uh, I, will s I will change uh, to the example. And just let me set up. I'll connect to our testing infrastructure and um, I have SSH'd in. Uh, basically, we have a running application uh, in, the, in the staging environment, the application server, and I'm now connected directly into that, uh, into that uh, server, into that application. So that is quite common. Um, you can imagine that is like if you had a Python program and you had the, the command line basically would be di directly connected to the running program. So, is that big enough for you? Can you read it or should I make it big, okay. bigger? I will make it a bit bigger. Um, better? Yes. Okay. So, what I will do. So this is, this is the REPL, I could you know, like write something here and it will evaluate and that runs on the server actually. So that, 
but uh, that is not how you develop software, right? You have an IDE and uh, you have you have um, you have everything sh uh, in an editor, and that is what I will do in in the, uh, in the last few minutes. So imagine you have you have some problems in production. Uh, you have people connect uh, to your server, and then for some reason these connections drop in in some circumstances and um, you have you want to debug this right but how, how do you do that you could do you could do tcp dumps and you could do uh, all kinds of all kinds of uh, things but um, why wouldn't you use your program to debug these problems right you have everything that you need you should you should have all the data in the program so the idea here is we have uh, engines and the application server hides behind engine engine x basically it's it's a proxy reverse proxy and uh, so Ng uh, i need engines to give me more data so i can debug this problem and so i told engine x that uh, engine x should put uh, Port information, TCP port information, and uh, the round trip, ta round trip time uh, into into some headers that I'll parse and uh, work with with uh, this information on, uh, on an ongoing basis. Right. So. Okay. I'll just show my notes. Okay. So. What, what I will do, I will introduce just, just to simulate something, right? So you can see something. I'll, I'll introduce a new route. And um, in this, this, are, this, this is all data that is actually running in production, right? This is code that is actually in OrcPad. Um, and I'll, I'll introduce a new route. Let's say it's um, net info, and I'll label it as utils net info. Very, very basic, right? So, and I'll take this label, and of course I need to tell my handlers that there is a new route and that they should, uh, that it, there's uh, something should happen with it, right? So I write um, utils net info and then I give it a function. I just give it the symbol, basically. So let's say it will also be called net info. Okay. And uh, of course, I got uh, the, yeah, the IDE tells me you don't have this function, right? So, so I need to implement it somewhere. And that's what I will do. I have something that looks quite similar over here. Uh, so I do the same for IP addresses. And uh, so I, I will do something similar for ports as well. Right, so I just copy the function, uh, name it differently, of course. And what does it do? Well, I know the, the header is called x forwarded port, right? So. Um, then I get the request. So, sorry, I have it's two screens. It's a bit different, difficult to navigate. Uh, I get the request right here, and then I do something, something to it. And this is this um, arrow that is uh, that is so-called threaded macro. So what what happens here is basically that uh, the first thing evaluates and then gets put here, like behind, behind the first uh, par uh, argument, or before the first argument, so to say, right after a function call, and then this gets evaluated. So it's basically a pipeline. Right? It's very handy because I don't need to read from the, from the right to the left. I can read from the left to the right or top to bottom. Uh, so just to speed things up a bit, um, I will I will parse um, the address from 
using some other utility functions from the request, right? So that is, I have now the address. Uh, I want to, I, I was looking for the port. So um, I'll write in the port and um, I don't have this function, right? So I need to implement that function to get the port. So what do I do? I switch uh, to the other namespace and I see here is the function for how to get, get the IP address and I need to implement um, the, the port function. So I'll just to shorten things, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, from my notes copy, copy the functions in. You see that I basically uh, look up the header and then uh, to, because port number is always a number then I can all, uh, just make it a number and not a string. So that is what I do. And these other things are basically the, the, same, the same thing, but for the round trip times uh, for TCP connections. So, um, okay, so now I have the, I can, I can send it to my REPL, so it evaluates and I have, have it available. Client, and you see uh, the ID uh, gives me these, these functions. Uh, request, right? And then I want to uh, have the socket address, and that is socket address, and in that address and in that port, right? So what what does this do? This is interop with Java. Uh, so inet socket address is something that is built into Java and enables me to make sure I have a valid IP, uh, IP and port. And it needs the IP address uh, for that to, to work. So um, I, want to, I want to know what type of address that is. Uh, if it's IPv4 or IPv6, that is just more information for my, for my debugging. So I do that very quickly in that address type um, and uh, just get address and socket address, right? So that is that just gives me the address format, basically. And now I need to distinguish um, what type it is and then I will just ask what, what object that, that is in instance and in that for address, oh yeah, all right, it got edit in, at the top, in it address type, right? So if, if it's instance of init for address, then I just return four. If it's instance of init six address, I, uh, I, will, I will return six, right? So now with all the information in place, I can, I can, um, I can um, return something, right? So that is, th this, this would be a bit insufficient. So what I do, I will return it as JSON because why, why should I complicate stuff? JSON, CLJ, JSON. Now I can give it just a map of keys and values. Uh, get host string socket at socket at address uh, my port that I was talking about that that I didn't have before and I can give it the TCP round trip time and uh, I just use here the the other functions uh, because I don't have to do anything else for that so. And uh, you should be able, in a minute, to go over to, oh, and I need to, of course, change this to application JSON, right? And so, uh, of course, I now can send it to my uh, REPL, and you should be able to go to uh, a specific address and get, uh, get the information, right? So, let me... Let me send these routes there. 
I need to evaluate basically all these namespaces. And you see, uh, s we, there is some state management already built in. So um, some things need to uh, happen in some specific order. So that got all handled uh, by the infrastructure for me. So I don't know, uh, I, I don't need to know in which order it has to happen. It gets evaluated from my source code. And uh, so just to check in the last minute, um, we, can, we can skip here. And basically I should be able, yes, right? So this, uh, and every time I call it, I get a different number, you see. So it works, right? And it seems to use the same connection each time, but it just uh, has some different parameters for TCP. So th that's, that's, that's about it, a short example. I think we are about done. We right? have one minute, so mm -hmm. maybe if you have any questions, you can ask the speaker now. It was all quite fast, I think. <laughs> any questions? In that case, uh, I will show you uh, one more thing. Um, I, I thought uh, that was all closure. Uh, I think for some of you, it would be interesting to know how, how it looks like when you develop in closure script. And uh, just, just a very short idea. I now have um, in development on my local machine, this um, copy of, of, or, uh, of OrcPad. Uh, one, one org page basically with one, one cell and one image. And now if I want to just get, I am connected into it, and if I just want to not get some uh, these units, what, what, what they look like, okay, I, I need to uh, connect to it. But okay, so here you see that, that basically my Boromir is right here. And here I have uh, some uh, the image, right? so the content is just some HTML image tag.